Hello you multi-massive misspenders and mainstream malts and thank you, thank you, not thank you, thank you to Danny Hebenton or Hebenton for that malt mention. Welcome to the Bothy Malt Mates, the Whiskey Zone. Uh, geek anorak stuff, this is where you'll find it. I'm Ralphie, your host. I've been drinking whiskey for a long, long, long time and I'm sharing my journey with you so that your journey is more effective than mine. So you won't make so many purchasing mistakes and when you are buying your whiskey, you'll be more informed. And one of the ways in which you can be more informed is in background or peripheral peripheral knowledge relating to distilleries. And I'm talking in the context here of Scotch whiskey distilleries, but I could be talking about any distilleries anywhere in the world producing any spirit. And really the focus here in Ralphie Review 951 Extras is understanding completely the difference between active distilleries, passive distilleries, mothballed distilleries, dead distilleries. What's the difference between them? And really it's to do with their stage or, of production or, or lack of production. Because every distillery, particularly with Scotch whiskey, has a singular identity, a signature for virtue of the fact that Scotch single malt whiskey distilleries are producing malted barley spirit, which is relatively delicate in its style. So it's the opposite end of corn whiskey and rye whiskey, which are very, very heavy and weighty and tend not to change much over time in casks, which is one good reason why you have mixed mash bill production of distillates in the USA and separate mash bill production of spirits in Canada. So as the blending of different spirits can bring together a, a, a more complex whiskey than otherwise you would get if you used 100% corn or 100% rye. And rye blends beautifully with other whiskies. It, it, I mean, my favorite bourbons, for example, are rye infused bourbons rather than wheat. Wheat I find simply too light. Uh, so like Blanton's, for example, I find to be bland. Whereas, um, let me see, a good example would be Elijah Craig, right? Elijah Craig or Buffalo Trace, which have got more rye component in them. I enjoy these bourbons more. They've got more bite. They've got more substance to me, to my palate. But let's focus here on Scotch single malt distilleries. Where you have an active distillery, we'll start with the active ones. Basically, these are working distilleries that are ap actually operating at this moment in time and producing liquor with their distinctive signatures and personalities. Um, obvious examples would be Springbank, McAllen, Ardbeg, Bowmore, Gl Glenfarclas. These are active working distilleries. But you also have in Scotland passive working distilleries where you don't see them um, of you know bottled as being from that distillery so these are distilleries which are creating spirit they're actively operating but they're creating spirit not under their own name but for other brands and an example of that is Starlaw and you've probably never heard of Starlaw Distillery. It's one of Scotland's most invisible working distilleries. Uh, another example is Caninvey. Caninvey Distillery, which is part of the Glenfiddich Group. And you, you see it bottled as monkey shoulder. But you don't see it bottled as actually Caninvey, which is the name of the distillery. Which is why you don't tend to be aware of the distillery. So these are two good ac good examples, malt mates, of active passive distilleries where they are producing liquor but you don't really hear of them because they're producing under another name so effectively they're rendered invisible. Then you have distilleries which could be producing 
but they're no longer producing because they have been mothballed. Now mothballed means that the understanding, the interpretation in the Scotch whisky scene is of a distillery which is capable of producing whisky but is not actually producing whisky at the moment but it has done in the past and a very good illustrative example of that at this moment in time is Rosebank Distillery in Falkirk which produced some excellent whisky in, in the old days until it was basically they just stopped production they put up the security cameras around the building and a great big fence around it and just nothing was happening for years and years and years and then they started to remove some components of the distillery the stills for example were removed and you find this happens quite quietly there's never any fanfares about it um, certain distilleries they close down they're kind of mothballed they could start producing again but some literally could just start producing tomorrow like for example Scapa uh, which is a mothball distillery so you don't see much of Scapa it's an occasional distillery so now and again they'll start it up and produce something just to keep it ticking over to keep it alive but you have other distilleries that are mothballed much more severely so that essential Equipment has been remo removed, either dismantled, sold off, scrapped, stolen. You know, there's a number of permutations. So Rosebank, again, is a good example of that. So that in the, the refurbishment of Spring of Rosebank, not Springbank, it's another distillery, of Rosebank, um, they will have to reintroduce new stills before they can start producing. So a lot more expense involved in getting the distillery up and running again. And when it does appear, I can tell you right now, it's going to be, I mean, it's my personal opinion. So, you know, don't listen to me. <laughs> it's going to be expensive. It's going to be really quite expensive because it's a prestige distillery, right? like Brora, the, the new, newly refurbished Brora, which is another really good example of a mothball distillery, which was effectively um, not quite dismantled, but it was certainly, you couldn't just get it running up and again in a, in a week, put it that way. But it's been refurbished more as an experience and a visitor facility now. Than, but although there's a still a working distillery in it of sorts, uh, but it's very much a corporate experience, if you know what I mean. Because it's real life, you know, it's, it's all part of the permutations and varieties that you find with Scotch whisky. And then you get distilleries which are dead distilleries. These are distilleries which may have been mothballed, or maybe they weren't but they've actually been closed down and put beyond use, either dismantled, demolished, or turned into some, something else, which means they can never actually produce single malt whiskey again. And my last review was for Capardonach, which is a very good example of a dead distillery where literally at the moment, there's just some whiskey left which is now being bottled as official bottling, but you will probably still find it available as older bottlings from independent bottlers like Signatory, for example, who probably still have some Capadonic in stock. But because of the age, there's going to be quite a significant premium on the price if you want to buy it. But you're, you're genuinely getting a blast from the past. When you open a bottle of whiskey from a dead distillery, you're never going to taste that again. It's gone and it'll never happen. Other illustrative examples of dead distilleries are Little Mill, for example, and St Magdalen, um, both lowland distilleries, and both have now been converted into residential flats, which means they could never, never produce whiskey again. To give you one example of a dead distillery which 
possibly could produce whiskey again, but only after a massive invent investment in refurbishment would be Glenlochy. Uh, but many other distilleries that once, once a distillery is declared dead, nine times out of 10, it's gone. It's completely gone. Another example, good example of a distillery which escaped that fate. You know, effectively it was a dead distillery, but it was with considerable expense re-established re was Annandale. But nobody's talking about Annandale because it's far too expensive for such a young whiskey. Uh, and it's nobody's radars. But as regards a lovely distillery to visit, you know, it, it is. But its product's just horrendously expensive for what it actually is. But these are good illustrative examples of the different stages in a distillery's life. There's one more stage that's worth mentioning now because we're seeing a lot of this at the moment. And it's birthing distilleries. Distilleries which are... They have been on the drawing room table. They have been in the architect's office. And they're now at this stage starting to have their foundations laid. And there's quite a number of these distilleries at the moment, which we don't hear so much about. And it's probably a good thing because there's nothing worse for a, a fledgling distillery to be overhyped, followed by a first bottling of disappointment where the first bottling is simply too young and too overpriced. That kills a distillery at birth. Uh, trust me, distilleries, I'm watching it happen. So you have these pre-birthing or birthing distilleries, and we're seeing a lot of them. There's roughly about 40 at the moment in Scotland, and there must be over 100 elsewhere in the world that are producing exclusively whiskey. In other words, a spirit made from grain. So it's good to give you this overview, this awareness, this, this perspective, because it helps you get your bearings as you navigate the rather confusing multi-labyrinth of getting to know whiskey in all its permutations and styles and hypes and publicities and online conversations. I'm Ralphie. I hope you've enjoyed this extras. Uh, join me again soon in which I shall be reviewing a, a really interesting single malt, which is well worth getting. It's an affordable one, right? So affordable, accessible, good price, good quality, challenging. That's the word, challenging single malt, which I'm going to recommend to an experienced whiskey drinker to see in the new year. But before I finish, before I conclude this extras, if you're enjoying the content, hey, and you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. Uh, you can always unsubscribe later, but if you want to be regularly informed, seeing that I don't seem to be shadow banned anymore, um, you know, hey, it's, we're talking about liquor and it's wicked and dangerous, blah, blah, blah. And it gets complaints, etc. It's just like cigar reviews. They get complaints as well. You know, it's bad for you. You know, it's going to destroy you. You've sold your soul etc. You know, the, there's so much super sensitivity out there at the moment that's been heavily politicised. And I'll leave it at that. I'm just going to leave it at that. But we're all affected by it. And I'm affected by it on this channel. So if you do want to uh, be kept informed of Whiskey Refuse and you haven't subscribed, please do, because it means there's more chance that you'll be aware of my content rather than it being relegated from your feed because you haven't subscribed. There you go. I also have a Patreon channel, Patreon stroke Ralphie, R-A-L-F-Y, at patreon.com. You'll find a link down below. And just for a wee dram, uh, just a wee dram per month, you get a valuable additional content, whether it be rants, whether it be thoughts, overviews, some controversial opinions, and, of course, bi-monthly live streams. Mop mates, as always... It's a joy and a pleasure, and my final advice is keep your malt moments malty. <laughs>